Welcome back to Troy Talks Wrestling. On today's episode of the Past and Present, a pro wrestling podcast, we're talking about Christopher Keith Irvine, better known as Y2J. He was born on November 9th, 1970. He was born on Manhasset, Long Island in New York. His parents are Canadian, however, and his dad was a professional hockey player named Ted Irvine. After his father retired, they moved back to Canada, and that's where he grew up. Isn't that right? Yes. I believe that's where he found his love for pro wrestling. Yes. Speaking of which, his pro wrestling childhood idols were Owen Hart, Ricky Steamboat, and Shawn Michaels. Correct. At the age of 17, he graduated high school. He still wasn't old enough to go to wrestling school yet, so he went to the Red River Community College to get his studies done. He graduated when he was 19, and he actually started wrestling when he was 18, so he was doing both at the same time. He was wrestling at the Hart Family School, or wrestling school, and it was known as the Dungeon. The Dungeon, where they were pretty much known for brutalizing their students. Just torturing them and endlessly. Other students are known as Brian Pillman and Crispin Wall. So, so few other names there. <laughs> While training there, he met Lance Storm, the Impact player, and their first match was together. And his gimmick at this time was Cowboy Chris Jericho, even though he's Canadian. So that makes sense, and obviously that did not work. So <laughs> he took his last name Jericho from the Halloween album. Walls of Jericho. Which I believe Halloween featured a guitar player by the name of Ingve Monstein. <laughs> which, if you don't know who he is, he was really good and he let you know it. Okay. And then he started traveling all over the world to wrestling and he perfected every style, including Japanese and Lucha. His first big American exposure was at ECW when Mick Foley recommended him to Paul Heyman. He said that he had a good time at his time at ECW, and that every um, that everybody liked him because he was so good with different wrestling styles. So in 1996, on August 26th, he made his debut on Monday Night Nitro. Who did he go against? Alex Wright, my uncle Steven's favorite. Oh yeah. Das Wunderkin, Alex Wright. Yes. <laughs> Dance. Yes. Wrestle. Yes. <laughs> Those are some good dance moves. Yeah, thank you. He quickly impressed his bosses and became a staple in the cruiserweight division. This is where I really first started watching Chris Jericho. I didn't get ECW. Back then, it was mostly done with tape traders, and Mm. I was not in a circle of tape traders, so I didn't get it. Mm. So, he was a crowd favorite every week. He wrestled the likes of Rey Mysterio, Chris Benoit, and Eddie Guerrero, and his gimmick was the Lionheart, which was pretty much just smiling and being a baby face and that's it but he still managed to wow the crowd even through this playing gimmick he amps things up by turning heel by attacking Rey Mysterio with a leg with a toolbox not the toolbox that's morphed into a, into a comedic heel who everybody loved because it was really funny <laughs> this is when I started liking him mostly is when he's, his humor started coming out. I mean, he became entertaining as well as a good wrestler. Mm-hmm. He started a feud with Dean Malenko, the man of 1,000 homes. And then, on one night, he brought out a list that was 1,004 homes. And you can list some of them. Well, what happened was, he was, it was at the end of his match on Nitro. The cameras cut off. And while the cameras cut off, he starts bad-mouthing the sports teams of the town. I think they were in Chicago. So he starts telling all the fans of how, how horrible their team is. That way, when the cameras come back on, they're booing him and they're throwing stuff at him. And he was listing all these different holds that he knew. However, if you go back and watch, every third or fourth one is a different arm bar. <laughs> he would say, the Irish leg whip, the Sinskooky arm bar, the figure eight arm leg. And then he'd be like, okay, and then the uh, Saskatchewan arm bar. Like every other one came back to a different kind of arm bar. He became the cruiserweight champion, and he said that every, it was a conspiracy victim. Everybody's out to get him, including the American government, because they want that title of his. More comedic segments came as he 
had his friend Ralphus, the truck driving bodyguard, who would help him get lost on the way to the ring. And everybody loved it because it was funny. Ralphus was a legit truck driver for WCW <laughs> that he hired to be an on camera bodyguard, to, almost to make fun of Goldberg. The way Goldberg would have security escort him to the ring. Uh, so that he wouldn't risk getting injured on those way the ring and breaking the streak unfairly. And so Jericho was just being silly and hired Ralphus, who was obviously not a bodyguard. Uh, and the crowd loved it, and it worked until Rufus decided he wanted to get paid like the wrestlers. And then that came to a screeching halt. Rufus? He said Rufus. Uh, well... What's his name? Ralphus. Ralphus. Okay. So he went to New Japan for a while, then came back to WCW, but he wasn't happy with this position because Cruiserweights were only seen as opening acts or mid quarters, pretty much. And so he decided, I'm going to start a feud with Goldberg. So he goes out and he starts insulting him, and Goldberg did not like this because Goldberg was a stick in the mud, who was serious about everything. Oh, wrestling's serious. It's. It's a show. Calm down, all right? <laughs> but anyway, he came out and speared Jericho, but Chris Jericho didn't care because this still got him attention, and he was trying to work his way up to the top. Well, it started off with uh, Jericho challenging Goldberg to matches, and Goldberg wouldn't even be in the building, so he would have the ref count him out and then raise his hand. So truth be told, Chris Jericho is the one that broke Goldberg's streak <laughs> by forfeit. Technically. Yes. And also, another thing that people don't know about a lot is Chris Jericho had untied his shoe before Goldberg speared him, and he had stepped on the heel of it and to where it would fly off easily. And then when Goldberg speared him, he kicked his leg up so that his shoe would fly off. And that way, it would look like Goldberg speared him out of his shoe. See, once again, Jericho's actually putting him over, making him look awesome, and Goldberg just didn't want to do business. This is what caused him to go over to the WWE. All he had to do was wait out his contract. On August 9th, 1999, everybody was going crazy about the Y2K bug. So, they used this to their advantage. The countdown to the millennium happens as the rocks in the ring, and one of the greatest debuts of all time happened. New music starts playing, and then you, you see the words of Jericho pop up on the Titantron, and the crowd goes crazy. Ah, it's Chris Jericho, yeah. Hey, <laughs> so the rock's out there, and he comes out, and they have a head-to-head promo session, I guess. I don't know. It, it was one of the loudest uh, crowd reactions I'd ever heard. I was watching it live when it happened on TV, and I had no clue that the countdown to the millennium was going to be Jericho. And they had to work hard to overcome the stigma of being a WCW boy. And Vince did not like him backstage. He said this contract wasn't worth the paper that he was written on. And this actually just made him want to work harder. He worked so hard that he even put over China to help her. As he was putting China over, this showed a lot of teamwork player in him. Because there were some wrestlers there, such as Jeff Jarrett, who I believe threw a fit when Vince asked them to put China over. And Jericho was like, yeah, I'll do it. Which really started a whole new era of wrestling. when, Especially for women. For women, absolutely. He ended up in the main event at WrestleMania in 2000. However, it was he was not in it at the end because speculation says that either Triple H got him into zero or Mick Foley just wanted to have a main event himself. So we may never know the truth. We may never know the truth, but however... In uh, Chris Jericho's book, No is a Four-Letter Word, uh, available on Amazon and at bookstores locally. We are not sponsored by them. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, He talks about how Triple H has not always been his biggest fan of his in-ring work, his promos, and such. And at the same time, though, Triple H is a professional, and when he did work with him, he gave him good matches. But yeah, he's never been the biggest fan of Chris Jericho. Mm-hmm. And also, he was actually rescheduled in a different WrestleMania match this year against Kurt Angle or Chris Benoit for the Intercontinental European Championship, and he won. Which, that, would have, that was a good match because you had three awesome wrestlers in it. And he started a few with Chris Benoit and Eddie Guerrero. 
who had come over from WCW recently, like him. And the fans were giving this a lot of support. He had a false win against Triple H for the title, but it was revoked because the ref counted too fast. That darn ref. <laughs> and it was revoked, but everybody was on Jericho's side, even though it was little. So it's funny. Soon after this, Chris Benoit and Chris Jericho had a ladder match at the Royal Rumble 2001. After that, they started working together to defeat a heel stunt called Steve Austin. And this was his first real shot at a main event. He beat The Rock for the WCW title and beat Stone Cold for the WWF title in the same night. So it was the first ever undisputed champion, which means that he had both at the same time. He was the first ever WCW and WWE world champion at the same time. And I'm going to go back and address the whole Chris Benoit, Chris Jericho against Stone Cold and Triple H. That's actually the same time where Triple H tore his quad and missed almost a year. So that was bad timing for that feud, but it worked out pretty well for everybody in the end. Mm-hmm. So, unfortunately, due to bad writing after this, uh, Chris Jericho was just like Stephanie McMahon's like little helper or whatever to defeat her husband, which is pretty weird. Okay. Well, I mean, it comes back to the whole uh, Jericho and Triple H relationship. And it not going very well. Yeah. He started cheating during opening matches, and it just made him look weak. He might have been in WrestleMania that year just to lose the titles, both of them, to Triple H. Again, bad writing made him look weak. But to be fair, this is also the same night of Hulk Hogan versus The Rock, and it stole the show, so kind of hard to compare to that. What was the very first wrestling match you ever watched? That one, The Rock versus. Hulk Hogan. WWE split the company into SmackDown and Raw. It wasn't the same roster anymore. So, he w- he was at SmackDown, but he went to Raw. And this entered him into a feud with Shawn Michaels. And this was setting up for WrestleMania 19. And this is really cool because it was his childhood hero. I mean, who doesn't want to wrestle their childhood hero? That's cool. Well, I mean, as long as they're a wrestler. If they're not, that's kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. I'll agree. <laughs> And then he began a feud with Goldberg, who, again, Goldberg was a jerk, don't like him. But that's besides the point. It was uh, to his credit that whether or not he won or lost, he stole the show either way. I will say there's been a lot of talk from Bill Goldberg about this time in his life, from WCW to even here. And even he has said that he thought too highly of himself. Mm-hmm. And he should have realized what was going on instead of listening to everybody talking to him and this is also the time i believe this is the time where chris jericho and bill goldberg got into a physical altercation mm-hmm. in the back and, and chris jericho beat the snow out of him he, yeah goldberg did not come out on the winning end of that fight mm-hmm. uh, jericho might not be the biggest dog in the fight but he's pretty tough for uh, the next two years he just bounced around from feud to feud pretty basic stuff nothing too exciting he did come up with the idea for the Money in the Bank match, so that's pretty cool. I mean, that's a pretty iconic match, so cool. He founded the band Fozzy back in 1999, and he was feeling very burnt out on wrestling, so he decided to step away from the ring and focus on his music. Which he met a lot of the members of Fozzy, I believe, at a show at WCW, because there was a band called Stuck Mojo that was supposed to do a musical performance at WCW show, and I'm pretty sure uh, that the lead guitar player of Stuck Mojo is started talking to Jericho about hair bands and stuff they liked. And that's where they formed a friendship before forming the band Fozzy. Mm-hmm. On August 22nd, 2005, he was written off in a girl fired match versus John Cena. Ugh. Can't see me. <laughs> <laughs> so he could do music full time. Uh, his WWE contract went, would expire three days later, um, and he wouldn't step back in the ring for another two years. So, this is when he started taking roles in films and TV. I'm going to read these off because most of them are so weird sounding that I can't remember them. Okay. Dancing with the Stars, pretty basic. Sharknado 1 and 3. He apparently looked through 1. I don't know, I didn't see it. 
I bought that for him, which is a 2009 horror slasher movie. And Resurrection of Jake the Snake, a 2015 documentary film. That's very good, and we recommend it. <laughs> he released his first book out of four, A Lion's, a Lion's Tale, all around the world in spandex. <laughs> uh, all these things prove that he was, if he had a dream, he was going to do it. He was going to accomplish it. He was a modern day Renaissance man. Renaissance man. <laughs> okay. September 24th, 2007, edition of Raw. Randy Orton's cutting a promo, and then Chris Jericho comes back, and he has short hair, and he does a new finisher called the Code Breaker, but it was kind of a flop. Never really clicked with anybody. Yeah. And I think he was trying to do away with his, the Y2J, mm-hmm. and move into the GOAT phase. Mm-hmm. So, by 2008, one of my favorite years in wrestling, uh, he started to feud Shawn Michaels, his childhood hero again, and it's called Blood Feud. And they had some pretty awesome matches. And there was a part where he was supposed to, like, try to punch uh, Shawn Michaels. But he would, like, accidentally, like, punch his wife. But whenever he did it, he actually punched her in the face for real. <laughs> <laughs> Shawn Michaels and Chris Jericho eventually had a ladder match for the WWE Heavyweight title at No Mercy that year. And Jericho won. He then starts wearing a suit and, like talking quiet and stuff and he was turning him and he stripped away all the things that made him likable and all that <laughs> and the fans just they're like ah boo <laughs> <laughs> well the, the suit wearing and the speaking softly he says he took from the movie No Country for Old Men the villain in it the movie. villain in it because he spoke very softly he was calm he never got excited even when the guy got shot, he was just matter of fact and just even kill. And that's where Chris Jericho is wanting to go with it because he said, that seems more psychotic than if some guy's just running around screaming yeah. while he's committing crimes. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. And from the looks of this game, Vince really trusted him to just do what he wanted. Do he knows best, apparently. So, Batista, John Cena, Fuse, blah, blah, blah. Nothing too important. And then, at Wrestlemania, he has a match with three legends. Jimmy Snuka, a, a murderer, <laughs> um, Roddy Piper, and... Was it Ricky Steamboat? Yes, it was. And it was awesome because, I think mean, Ricky Steamboat's another one of his childhood idols. That's awesome. And it also revived Steamboat's career, and Jericho helped put him over. And the whole point of that was to build up the movie The Wrestler for Mickey Rourke. Mm-hmm. Mickey Rourke was there... And he was supposed to take taken part in the match, but they couldn't come to terms on the money, and so he had a little impact moment at the end of the match, but he didn't actually take part in the match. Mm-hmm. Jared goes to the point in his career where he wants to help the next generation of young talent with their careers. So he helps uh, Cody Rhodes, Ted DiBiase Jr., Crown Tom, MVP, Jack Swagger, Evan Warren, people like that. Around this time, he also wrestled Daniel Bryan slash Bryan Danielson in his first WWE match. And it was at this time also that he wanted to go back on tour with Fozzie. Isn't that very nice, very evil? Oh, yes! Introducing my man! Here we go, here we go, here we go. Bam, 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 Chris Judas. Chris Judas. So, he had to wait to be written off TV. And so Randy Orton punts him in the head, and oh, it injured him so much that he can't wrestle anymore. Ah. <laughs> this is the last time that you see him as a WWE performer full time. Um, and he released his second book, and he finally returns to the WWE, sporting a light up jacket and refusing to speak, pretty much. He's 23 years into his career, but he's still working hard to come up with new ideas. He feels the same punk. CM Punk wins. He was to tour with Fozzie again. Chris Julius. When <laughs> he released their fifth album, Sin and Bones, 2013, he comes back in the Royal Rumble and then he helps put Fandango over. And, yep. Yeah, I don't know why they wanted Fandango to be Chris Jericho, but okay. <laughs> um, he releases his third book, The Best in the World at What I Have No Idea. <laughs> uh, then he starts a podcast. Called Talk is Jericho. It's 
it's a big success. Pretty big thing. And then in, in January 2016, he returns to feud with AJ Styles, which is dream matches for some people. Mm-hmm. And it really helped to skyrocket AJ in the WWE. Yeah. Because before that, your hardcore wrestling fans knew who he was, but mm-hmm. your WWE fans mm-hmm. uh, didn't exactly know who he was. And so for Jericho to feud with him, it puts him on a whole other level automatically. Started focusing on the comedy aspect of it a little more. And he started wearing scarves. Hmm. Like such? Mm-hmm. And calling the fans stupid idiots. You stupid idiot! Mm-hmm. In the summer of 2016, he started. He had a tag team with Kevin Owens and their best friends. And he started the list bit. Everybody loved it. Yep, the list. So they would help each other cheat in matches and all this stuff. But this blew up its festival friendship because Kevin Owens goes to give Chris Jericho a gift. But what is it? It's the list of KO. And Chris Jericho's name is on it. And then he punches him in the face. And then I believe he threw him into the Jeritron. Yep. The same way that Jericho had done to Shawn Michaels. And he did this because Chris had messed him over because he got too eager about Kevin Owens defending his universal title to Goldberg. Once again, Goldberg. After a disappointing match between Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho at WrestleMania, Chris just became a booker for a while because he just didn't want to deal with that kind of stuff. So, yeah, fully understandable. He started the Rockin' Wrestling Ranger at sea, which is this cruise with rock music and Ring of Honor Wrestling. Um, and November 4th, 2017, he appears at a pre-typed interview at New Japan Pro Wrestling. Challenges Kenny Omega from the Bullet Club to a match at Wrestle Kingdom. Which is New Japan's version of like a Wrestlemania. Or right, Summer right, right. Big, big event for them. Mm-hmm. And this shows everybody, because Alpha versus Omega, get it, because it's a pun. Huh? Okay. And, pun intended. Yeah. Uh, he appeared as a villain character, inspired by Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. Uh, this was the first time he had done any work outside of WWE wrestling related since 1999. Yeah, it's a long time. And Dead Mouse gave the match five stars. He makes one more appearance for WB. He's backstage at Raw's 25th anniversary, and that's the last time he would ever to be seen on WWE television. He went to go work for New Japan for a while, and then Cody Rhodes and the Young Bucks put together the biggest indie show in America at the time, called All In. And it was huge, and everybody was so shocked when what looks like Pentagon Jr.'s mask, someone wearing the mask, goes in the ring. When Kenny Omega's match, but he takes it off and it's Chris Judas. Chris Judas is in the ring and he attacks Kenny Omega. Oh. <sighs> yep. And Are you calling him Chris Judas now? Yeah, I just said before. Okay. Um, this further their feud, and you had something to say about this. And rumor is that Vince McMahon was furious. How could Chris do this to me? Chris, you're not working here. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And this is the beginning of his relationship with Tony Khan. Khan! <laughs> On January 1st, 2019, AEW was begun because of the success of All In. And it was the first serious competitor for WWE since WCW. So. Well, the reason it's such an actual competitor for Vince is that Khan actually has more money than Vince. Yeah. So, yeah. so there you go. It that's what it takes to compete with a billionaire is another billionaire. Mm-hmm. January eighth, twenty nineteen, Chris Jericho or sorry, Chris Judas, uh tells everybody that, Hey, I signed with AEW, we're on the full contract, so yeah. So Kenny Omega and Chris Jericho, they had their big match and it's great. And then Chris Jericho wins the AEW long title that I have, see? And he's on the back. He was the first AEW champion. Okay. And then after this, Dynamite came on and it's been a wrestling favorite ever since. Tori, what would you say is your favorite Chris Jericho memory? Probably the lists. The lists? I like the list. Mine 
would be a personal experience I had. I was at a wrestling show at, for WCW in Peoria, Illinois, and I got to see Chris Jericho's very last match in WCW. And it was awesome. Because at the end of the night, Eddie Guerrero, I think it was, that picked up the microphone and said, Hey, everybody, this is Chris Jericho's last night in the company. Let's all give him a standing ovation. And he did. He got a standing ovation from everybody in the building. And then Chris Jericho grabbed the mic and started tearing up. And he just wanted to let everybody know that this town still sucks. And he threw the microphone down. And a, a huge pop. Everybody loved it. They thought it was great. So that was my favorite Chris Jer- uh, Jericho moment. You almost said Judas. I almost did say Chris <laughs> Judas. Thank you for starting that. You're welcome. So, well, before we um, end here, Tori is actually having her birthday. Yep. And we have something special for her to open today. Okay. Uh, something a little special for her. After doing this podcast, we thought it only appropriate to give it to her right now. Yeah. Okay, let's see what it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the Festival of Friendship. Check it out. I'm keeping this in the box. <laughs> yeah, you are. You think I'd let you open that? No. How cool is that? That is super cool. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Mm-hmm. Now, remember, uh, always, never, ever, not watch our videos again. So, Chris Jericho's done a lot, and he's done it better than most. So, is he the greatest of all time? Let us know what you think in the comments below. Please go subscribe to my other channels. Tori does everything, and Tori does edits. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Bye! Yeah. Hey everybody, this is The Stinger here with Tori. And if you haven't figured it out yet, Tori does everything. This is proof positive. It's showtime in Tori's world every day. Why? Because she does everything. It's showtime.